This week, I'm joined by Mr. Jeff Mann. We're going to interview Charles Thompson. He's the Senior Director of Product Management at Viavi Solutions. Talk about the importance of response and remediation in a strong security strategy. In our second segment, we're going to be talking about defending your environment against major Microsoft vulnerabilities. There's a couple of those, especially one recently with uh, remote desktop services. I defined four pillars. We'll see what Jeff thinks of those. Uh, we're also going to define what a major Microsoft vulnerability is. In the enterprise news, database security for Amazon RDS, Infoblox unveils a new addition to their platform. Palo Alto is launching a new Prisma Cloud security suite. And we've got some funding and acquisition updates that involve Recorded Future, Swimlane, and Silo, and Sentinel One. All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. The Viavi Solutions Observer Platform provides SecOps teams a powerful combination of comprehensive data for threat hunting and incident response that includes wired data analytics and enriched flow records. Using pure, unaltered packet and net flow, Observer presents views across the entire IT infrastructure with threat alert features including scope, impact, and advanced traffic profiling. Teams can use automated workflows to dive into high fidelity network evidence and more quickly resolve issues, minimizing impact on customers, users, and business operations. Learn more about the Viavi network security solution and download free resources at securityweekly.com forward slash Viavi. That's V-I-A-V-I. Is the fear of a cyber attack keeping you up at night? Are you worried that your business isn't properly protected? Keep your network up to date and secure from vulnerabilities with VSA by Kaseya. Kaseya's VSA patch management module installs, deploys, and updates all of your software from a single console. Kaseya's network antivirus provides real-time updates and ensures maximum security. Start sleeping peacefully all night long. To watch VSA in action, request a demo today by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Kaseya. That's K-A-S-E. YA. The greatest threat to businesses today isn't the outsider trying to get in. It's the people you trust, the ones who already have the keys, your employees, contractors, and privileged users. 60% of online attacks are carried out by insiders. To stop these insider threats, you need to see what users are doing before an incident occurs. Observe it enables security teams to detect risky user activity, investigate incidents in minutes, and effectively respond. Get your free trial at observeit.com forward slash security weekly. Welcome to episode 140 of Enterprise Security Weekly for June 5th, 2019. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined remotely by Mr. Jeff Mann. Jeff, welcome. Hey, thanks, Paul. Always a pleasure to fill in and get to do things a little bit differently. Take the enterprise focus. That's right. I love your uh, your background, Jeff, in your workshop. It's very nice. Is that a, is that a magic wand? <laughs> <laughs> No, it used to be a uh, clay pipe, but the pipe part broke off. Gotcha. So the stick is just hanging there. And this isn't a workshop. This is a, a cabin. A cabin. It's a, a man cave, a man cabin. It's a man cave. It's where I can actually join the show and, and have a stogie, nice. which I've always wanted to do. Sweet. Well, nice to have you here, Jeff. A uh, quick announcement before we get into our interview. Make sure you register for our upcoming webcast with SaltStack logarithm and domain tools uh all fantastic webcasts i really encourage our listeners to join securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts salt stack is an amazing platform for configuration management for lack of a better term so if you're using products like ansible or puppet or chef uh, and would like an alternative they have an open source and a commercial version and they gave a fantastic demo i think last week or I think last week on on paul security weekly so make sure you check that out uh also a technical segment's coming up uh, using domain tools, I'll be doing the technical segment, a really cool investigation and some neat little hacks that I did to uh, de-obfuscate some JavaScript and get to some domains to investigate. And we'll be talking more about that kind of stuff on their webcast. And of course, Logarithm's a longstanding sponsor and always has talented engineers sharing awesome information. For today's segment, I'd like to welcome Charles Thompson, the Senior Director of Product Management at Viavi Solutions. Charles, welcome. Thanks for having me, Paul. Good to be here. 
Nice to have you here. And now, Charles, we've been talking a lot about security forensics as kind of a term, uh, which is which is really interesting. And uh, it, I like to kind of go back to the beginning of my career in security, where I think there was much less of a threat landscape, uh, much less systems. I think that we had to defend applications. We could get a lot of stuff really off the wire, and we spent a lot of our time in intrusion detection. Of course, that really changed, I think, in the early 2000s when Microsoft Worms ran around, and we just couldn't do forensics and uh, you know network anomaly detection fast enough. And then you fast forward to today, we have so many sources of information, and it sounds like these are some of the challenges that you're, you're working with today, Charles. Well, they really are. You know, I mean, it, it, the way I like to think about it is as a continuum, right? So securing a, an IT infrastructure really has, in my mind, three distinct phases. There's the prevention phase, the detection phase, and the remediation phase. And if you look at where spend is and where focus is, of, of the call it, let's just say $11 billion that's spent on network security every year, only $200 million is spent on remediation, which basically means that everybody's spending their money on locking the doors and you know having a, a sensor alert system. And, and everybody's pretty much banking on the idea that it's not going to happen to me. Right? We're not going to suffer a breach. We're not going to suffer a security event. And you know, as we all know, right, uh, that's just not the case. Right, the, Everyone's going to suffer a breach at, at some point because attackers only need to be right once, right? Security professionals need to be right uh, every single time, you know, every single day, you know, for, for years on end. And so, um, as you said, you know, there, there's so many different areas of infiltration for an attacker, and not to mention, you know, the, the threats that come from inside that uh, it's incredibly difficult for organizations to, to effectively keep up. And, you know, the, the reality is it is going to happen to every organization at some point. The question that we like to ask is, what are you going to be capable of doing when it does happen to, to your organization? You know, it's interesting. I covered a, a survey yesterday. So, oh, and <clears throat> it said that uh, they did a survey of a, a bunch of C-level executives and said that the uh, three quarters of the leaders say they believe a cybersecurity breach is inevitable, which means that one quarter don't believe that it's inevitable. And I was like, we need to do some uh, evangelizing about this problem that you were just, you know, you just mentioned that, Charles, that a, a breach is inevitable. A security incident of some kind is inevitable. And Charles, you bring in the data that the spend isn't there to deal with the problems when they happen. And we've seen countless examples of this, most state and local governments, large enterprises, big data breaches, right? We need to focus more, I think, on the remediation. Well, yeah, I mean, look, if, 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 if some of the biggest tech companies in the world, like, you know, Google and Facebook can, can be uh, the subject of an attack, if organizations that spend, you know, I'm sure hundreds of millions of dollars on security and, and their IT infrastructure, like Starwood Marriott, if they can be suffering some of the biggest breaches in history, do you honestly believe that your organization is not going to be uh, subject to a breach? Granted, some of the small organizations are, uh, you know, all obviously less of a target, but they also have a lot less sophistication in their IT infrastructure and a lot less capability to, to keep out attacks. And so this idea that it's not going to happen to us, or we're going to be the exception to the rule is just, you know, it's, it's not a very, it's not a very uh, reasonable approach in, in my opinion. And, you know, it's, it's what I keep hearing, right, is as CISOs are now part of the, the, the board of directors and you start getting more and more security conversations happening at that uh, executive level, you start hearing more and more people saying, guys, what are we going to do about this? Because if it, if it does happen to us or, or, you know, in more sophisticated organizations, when it does happen to us, what are we going to be capable of doing? How are we going to answer the questions that we ask internally and mm -hmm. that the regulatory bodies are going to be asking us? Yeah, it's that, that time to live is really, it's scary for me. And I think something that requires a lot more focus today on security, it's not so much in the prevention detection, but uh, if someone does get in, can we just reduce the time it takes to detect and remediate <laughs> that entire situation? Jeff? Yeah, uh, a couple thoughts. Um, you know, you were saying that the, you know, the smaller companies are, are ill-equipped to deal with the, the inevitable breaches and, and security incidents that do happen, but they're also uh, much more likely to not be able to recover from it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the question that immediately uh, came to my mind uh, as you're sort of, uh, you know, laying out uh, you know, the topic for today is, you know, when it comes to 
a breach has happened and we're going to do remediation, response, recovery, whatever you want to call it. I guess my question is, uh, can you break down what exactly are we talking about in terms of responding to an incident? Because I, I think there's a lot of different activities that, that need to happen. Are we talking about all of them or a specific subset of what do you do when the breach has happened and presumably you've discovered it? That's a good question, Jeff. Yeah, it's a really good question. So, you know, usually for our customers, what they're interested in being able to do is understand how the breach occurred so that they can ensure that they reestablish a secure posture, right? So first they mm -hmm. want to be able to understand how did this happen? Then they want to be able to understand is the worst over or are we in the midst of the worst right now? Have we really solved any of the issues that have led us to this point? And have we effectively boxed out the, the, the security vulnerability that has allowed the intruders to either get in or to exfiltrate content out of our environment? And then it's sort of an understanding of what was exposed, especially when you're dealing with regulatory bodies like HIPAA or, or PCI and, uh, uh, and obviously GDPR. You got to be able to answer the question of exactly what was was. Uh, made vulnerable during the attack, what was exfiltrated, and you know how wide is this is this breach really? So those typically are the questions that we want to be able to answer. And the way you go about it, obviously, is, is you have to be able to go back through the archives, through the records, and understand where was patient zero, how did the infiltration occur, you know, where was uh, staging taking place, assuming data staging was was part of the part of the attack, and then how did things exfiltrate and then what was that content that was exfiltrated. Otherwise you have no idea. Are we in the midst of it? Is it over? Have we effectively secured the environment? And you know what was what was made vulnerable during the attack. And that's just so it's so crucial for organizations to be able to answer those questions quickly. Because I, I, I truly believe that a, a lot of the major breaches, right, had they addressed that earlier on in the attack cycle it, it would be a non-issue, right? I mean, really almost a non-issue, right? If you go, oh, yep, they got in, but, you know, we caught them and here's, you know, kind of where we stopped them. The longer an attacker lives in your environment, the worse off you are in that breach. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily uh, a non-issue, but certainly it's it's minimizing uh, the impact uh, and the impacts to a company having a breach, you know, not only the the recovery costs, any possible litigation, civil suits mm -hmm. that are filed against them, you know, fines that are levied against them by, you know, whatever regulatory bodies are, you know, they fall under. Um, but I guess the very, I think what we're saying is, and I, I want to make sure we're articulating it to our audience, uh, a lot of these questions that we're asking or, or that we are saying need to be asked very early on are questions that companies need to be asking before a breach ever happens. You know, that's part of the exercise in terms of breach preparedness is, you know, what are the questions that we're going to need to ask and therefore need to be able to answer when the breach is discovered, when the breach, you know, does happen. Yeah, Jeff, I think that's a critical point, right, is you have to understand what what you're going to be asked in order to be able to effectively answer. And I think a lot of organizations, uh, you know, kind of take the approach, we've we've locked the doors, we've closed the windows, and, you know, we're not really going to worry about the, the rest of it. I, I think that a really good point's being brought up here, which is, you know, here we're talking today about security forensics, which is very much in the remediation phase. But think about the detection phase a little bit, too. Even before an attack occurs, how are most organizations going about the detection phase of that attack? A lot of organizations depend almost exclusively on, on baseline deviation, right? They're looking for major volumetric changes in data being exfiltrated or, you know, sudden connection volumes or, you know, maybe it's massive amount of ping sweeping. The reality is, is that smart attackers are very methodical. They're very patient. Patience is, is arguably one of the best virtues of, mm. of a great cyber attack, right? And so not only do you need baseline, but you know, baselines can be slowly deviated over time and attackers are well aware of the baseline capabilities of, of modern cybersecurity tools. And so not, not only do you need that, but you also need sort of call it that whitelist, right? You need to profile, here's what I know this device should be doing on a regular basis. And Jeff, I think it goes to the point that you're bringing up, which is not only what questions you're gonna be asked, but what is a known good condition for your environment? Not only when the, when the attack occurs, will I be able to answer those questions effectively, but how will I even know the attack occurred in the first place? With a sophisticated attacker that's able to take a methodical approach, things like whitelisting and, and device profiling, while it, it requires some time and effort on, the, on behalf of the organization, 
is critical to being able to help you in that remediation phase to know which systems were compromised and how widespread the attack was and, and so on. So I, you know, I guess the point is, is that organizations need to take a more proactive approach. You got to go hunting, right? Yeah. You can't just yeah. sit back yep. and, and wait for things to happen to you. You got to profile known good so that you can see deviations from bad, not just say, well, I've got a tool that baselines, you know, does percentile deviation. I'm sure that'll let me know when things go awry. Attackers are way too sophisticated for that. And that's what I think a lot of organizations are missing in their security strategies. Yeah, I, I agree, Charles. I think largely some, you know, much of the detection is looking at those drastic changes, right? In traffic and flows and, and things like that. And what threat hunting, I think, really allows you to do and a critical component we're talking about today is to really go look and consider multiple factors, right? Looking at logs, looking at network, looking at endpoints and understanding that you might find something because something sent one packet once and that and that was anomalous, right? And, and how do we get to that stage of understanding our, our network and analyzing our security events? Well, I think the uh, the real sixty four thousand dollar question here, you know, Paul, as you alluded to in the early days, you know, it was network admins that were you know staring at a screen, looking at network traffic in various different ways, but they could basically see the anomalies because you know they they had this sort of uh, mm. way of getting their arms around the network. You know, with as much data as flying that is flying around networks these days, as many more endpoints. Uh, you know, the threat landscape, as you put it, is much larger. I think we're necessarily, uh, as an industry, thinking we have to rely much more on automation. I'm still old school enough to think that, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong or if there's different opinions, but, you know, yes, you need to rely on automation, but there still needs to be somebody there that's just that got that intuitive sense of, whoa, that one packet that just came from that one endpoint like you said, that's anomalous. That's something that we should stop and take a look at. Because uh, I think too often the automation tools, at least the ones that I've seen, um, th there's too much of a possibility of, of tuning out the things as normal that mm -hmm. uh, are, are not normal. Like, and, and, you know, we're, we're all saying that you know, the, the, the attackers are very smart and they know how to fly under the radar. They know how to defeat the, a lot of the automated tools to do any kind of alerting because they know how to you know, fly underneath the threat, whatever the threshold is of the alerts that are going to be there. So uh, open-ended question, what else is there? What, you know, what are the fine, fine points of things that we can do? And, and hopefully that's a segue into to what Charles has to offer for mm -hmm. us. Yeah, Jeff, I mean, I, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, AI and machine learning and, you know, all these wonderful technologies of automation and, and investigatory capabilities of the tools are critical, right? You, you got to be able to help, you know, separate the, the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, um, and be able to bring to the top the items that perhaps potentially are, are of most interest, right? But as you point out, the attackers are well aware of those capabilities. And so they're going to be, they're going to be privy to that same type of, uh, of insight. And then they're going to be able to, to, to work ways to fly under the radar. I think the other thing that we see in our industry all the time is this concept of, and you pointed out, well, there's too much data. We couldn't possibly look at everything. So we're just going to have to accept that, you know, we're going to see a subset of what occurs. We're going to have to do summarization or we're going to top N things within the organization. And I'll, I mean, we see it time and time and time again, in the more sophisticated attacks, the ones that really matter and really change our industry is, you know, a smart attacker is not in your top end. So you've got to have what, what we think of as, you know, what we call full fidelity forensics, which means every packet all the time. You can't just segment out the ones that you think are related to anomalous behavior. You can't chop off the payload because, well, it's too onerous to save everything all the time or my tool's not capable of it. Uh, you need to have that when, you, when it comes time to do the investigations. I always liken it to security cameras, right? If you say, well, it's, it's unrealistic to record 24 hours a day with my security camera, so I'm only going to record the first five minutes of every hour and you know, we just won't worry about that other 55 minutes. It's like, come on, guys, attackers are smarter to figure out, you know, you come after, you know, 1205 and, and you're set for the next, you know, 55 minutes. So full fidelity forensic investigations are, 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 in my opinion, critical as an element that augments the AI and the machine learning and, and this automated infrastructure. But you've got to have you got to have all that data. And, you know, taking the attitude of there's too much data or my tool's not capable of that is just a it's just a cop out that's going to leave an organization exposed. So Charles, how do 
tell us a little bit about the Viavi solutions uh, in this area. Yeah, so so the Viavi portfolio focuses on two key uh, data sets, right? The first is is packets, right? And we all like to use the the term packets don't lie, right? Or the network doesn't lie. It's a great source of content because it's passive, it's out of band, and it's observing exactly what transpired on the wire. A sophisticated attacker can't go in and modify an event log to you know cover their tracks, right? It, it's it's observed passively out of band on the wire, and it's exactly what occurred. Jeff said, mm -hmm. you know the. A, a, a smart security engineer is going to be able to go in and say, I understand what this one packet contains and why that's the key to unlocking this entire entire uh, uh, mystery, so to speak. So packets are a critical data source. The other piece is flows, right? Mm -hmm. So enriched flow records allow an organization to be able to gain visibility out to the edge of their infrastructure where a lot of uh, attacks, you know, uh, uh, are initiated, as well as being able to see what content is exfiltrated. And again, that's another area where a lot of organizations say, well, you know, we have to top end our flows and we can't keep everything all the time. At Viavi, we firmly believe that full fidelity is the key to be able to do security forensics to any real... And, and Charles, you have your own solutions that are doing the packet analysis and the flow analysis. You have your own software that you've in, developed, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so Viavi has what we call the Observer Gigastore, mm -hmm. which is our uh, uh, packet capture and, and investigatory capabilities there. And then we have GigaFlow, which is our flow-based monitoring. And the two come together mm -hmm. inside of what we call Observer Apex, which is our top level, you know, bring it together tool. That's where our machine learning lives. That's where our analytics lives. And then the, the customers are able to drill down into the insights in, in flows and packets seamlessly through that one that one package. What I always like to say is, you know, if you think about this from a, a an organization that suffered a breach, you want to bring in experts, right? You want to leverage those third party organizations that are that are adept at being able to do security investigations, but you got to give them the raw content to be able to do the mm -hmm. investigations on when the event occurs. And so having all that content there is is critical. That's awesome. And I, I like to phrase it when we talk about threat hunting, um it, it John Strand and I, you know, worked on a, a, a product and one of the things that I really liked when John looked at the problem and then brought it to me was they were looking at most frequently occurring inside of the traffic, least frequently occurring, but also time between connections and then plotting, you know, through machine learning, the data sizes of those connections. And really, if you take a basic kind of approach like that to it, anomalies start to really pop out. And I'm assuming that's a similar kind of analytics that your platform is, is doing is giving the analyst those tools to say, oh, yeah, like... Look at that. It's not just about least and most frequent. There's other factors too, right? Yeah, that's right. That's that's absolutely right. And then if you, if you want to be able to take it a step further, if you've got what you believe is a malicious actor, you believe you've got a, a, a suspicious endpoint on your network, you've got all the content to be able to go in and drill into that one specific entity or that one specific actor and know exactly what transpired with them, what they sent, what they received, where they stored content, how they exfiltrated content. Mm -hmm. um, it, you, you've got the full record of everything that transpired, every conversation, every interaction. And so, Charles, does it also look at the endpoint information and logs as well, or is it your solutions focused just on the network and flows? Yeah, so with with the flow-based solution, we actually bring mm -hmm. in log-based information. We use what we call uh, enriched flow records, which is goes beyond traditional flow, and it reaches into devices that don't have the ability to generate flow, for example. It enriches that flow information with mm -hmm. user ID information from AD and LDAP environments. So you're actually bringing together multiple data sources into a single converged data record uh, that's you know heavily predicated on flow, but it's not exclusive to flow. So you're, and then it uh, seamlessly ties in with the packets. Go contextualizing ahead. the flow data. Because if anyone that's yeah. ever looked at flow data before is right, like oh, I got these two IP addresses that are talking. And I'm like, that kind of looks weird, right? For whatever reason. And you're like, but what is that? And then like, after you find out what it is, you're like, well, who uses that? Or usually the next questions. And that sounds like the kind of answers that you're providing, right? Is that context? Yeah, that's exactly it. And, and then on top of that, you've got the baseline and capability to be able to see what is normal, right, for this endpoint versus what's mm -hmm. occurring right now. But you've also got the profiling capability, right? Because again, as we talked about, a smart attacker is going to be able to, to fly under the radar and not deviate your baselines or deviate your baselines so slowly over time yeah. that you never ever end up in the red. And so that's where, you know, static uh, profiling capabilities to say this endpoint should be talking on these ports to these subnets, for example. Uh, and, and if I ever see anything different, well, that's that's something worth at least noting. And, and let's 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 mm -hmm. investigate it a little bit. Right. And and this is where the proactive nature. Right. This is where threat hunting comes in and and deviation hunting comes in for an organization that really wants to take security seriously. Mm. 
And, yeah, what I'm you. what I'm hearing is, uh, and I don't know if your tool does this, but you know, in terms of defeating the smart attacker that knows to fly under the radar, it seems to me like you know whatever the 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 checks that you have in place or the categories of checks that you have in place. Uh, if there's some way to randomize them or mix them up so that, you know, at any given time, uh, an attacker doesn't know which one of the <laughs> thresholds he needs to fly under. seems like that would be, you know, I mean, this is all a cat and mouse game when, it, when, it, when you come down to it. You know, how do you outsmart the, the smart attacker, uh, mix things up and, and, and leave them guessing a little bit? It, it either slows them down to the point where they're making a mistake or it, it, maybe it makes it, which is an ultimate goal of security, <laughs> makes it to uh, not you know you're too worthy of an opponent. I'm gonna I'm gonna abandon this effort and move on. Yeah, find a find a softer target somewhere else, right? And right. that's that's exactly it, right? That's the that's the goal is is you know in that detection phase, being able to detect and, and remediate so quickly that the attacker eventually just becomes frustrated and moves on. But you know in in, in organizations where you do end up with the inevitable happening, right? You suffer some type of a breach. You've got to be able to go back and effectively answer those questions of how did it occur? What was exposed? Is the worst over? Have we reestablished a, a secure posture for our organization? And then when your board of directors or your regulatory body start coming and asking questions like, you know, is this a breach that needs to be put in the news? Is this something that we needed to, to, send, to send out communication to our our client base, you've got mm -hmm. effective answers to that instead of just shrugging your shoulders and saying, I don't know what was breached. So we have to assume everything was breached and we have to tell our 500 client user base that potentially all of their information was, uh, was, was jeopardized. Charles, yeah, that's very that? true because um, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, a lot of the major breaches that we've heard about, you know, where hundreds of millions of records were uh, disclosed or lost very often it's, it's because what you just said, they don't know what was taken. So they just have to assume the worst, but yeah, any, any amount of, of data that you can collect that says, well, you know, we had a hundred million users in our database customers, but you know, it, it looks like the attacker was there for X number of minutes, X number of hours, whatever. And, you know, given the traffic that we saw, you know, they maybe got to 10% of our data. That, that would be huge in, in terms of nothing else, just sort of public, you know, consumer confidence when you're ultimately are reporting the breach to the public or to the regulators. Yeah, so, so we actually had one customer that suffered a situation very similar to that. There was one giant database, multiple tables, and some of the tables contained actual client information with payment card information and home addresses and so forth. And some of the databases, uh, database tables only included information about their mailing list, right? So being mm -hmm. able to differentiate and say this table was accessed by the attacker and this table wasn't was the difference between that organization having to publish a full on breach, breach statement and, and, you know, obviously accept the reputational impact and so forth of that scenario versus being able to say this can stay internal. You know, unfortunately, you know, the, the fact that we were going to market to the these folks in you know this state uh, was was made uh, aware, but you know no 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 payment information was breached, no home address information was breached, no health records were breached, so on and so forth. So having that ability to drill in and say it wasn't just this server, it was actually this individual database table that was accessed can be the difference between a breach that you know puts you in on the headlines of the news uh, versus you know something that that uh, an organization can remediate away within you know a few a few days. Charles, is that one of the most common problems that uh, folks come to you with, you know, uh, prospects and existing customers working in product management? I'm assuming you spend a lot of time with customers, right? Talking about their problems and challenges that understanding the impact of a breach, is that is that near the top or number one? Yeah, understanding the, the impact of the breaches is absolutely number one today, especially with, you know, CISOs being a, a board level responsibility, security mm -hmm. being a board level responsibility in the regulatory bodies and so forth. So understanding the 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 impact of the breach is definitely the the, the number one area where organizations are looking to leverage Viavi technology. Uh, and, you know, again, right, as you said, more and more organizations are starting to accept the idea that this is an inevitability. It's not an if, it's a win. Uh, and so being able to help out with that. But, you know, we got plenty of organizations that are worried about those savvy attackers that they believe they may have already jeopardized, uh, right. uh, suffered a breach, and they think they had a savvy attacker that's still in there covering up their tracks effectively, and they want to be able to put in technology that's going to allow them to be able to 
identify whether or not that is in fact the case. So, uh, but generally speaking, you're, you're, you're dead on. It's, it's scope and impact. And, what and exactly I, happened? How did it happen? And how bad was it? I like the approach too, because I find we don't often talk about the attacker's ability to cover their tracks, right? Because I feel like in a lot of penetration tests that you uh, consult with a commercial entity, right? They're not often at liberty to actually cover their tracks. In fact, last year, we, I think we had one segment uh, and it was an uh, individual from Israel that had done some testing for uh, the Israeli military or some such organization he couldn't name. And he was like, you know, I've, I've done this testing and here's how I figured out how an attacker can cover their tracks. We don't talk about it. And a lot of the covering the tracks is happening in log files, maybe on the system you've breached, maybe on other systems that you're going to breach to go cover your tracks and on the endpoints themselves, right? Bypassing endpoint software, covering your tracks through through the logs, the network just kind of remains as the last re resort for figuring out what happened because I guess we underestimate our attacker's ability to actually cover their tracks, right? And it's a, it's a true forensic record of exactly what transpired and how it transpired, exactly what protocols were used, exactly what, you know, uh, uh, flags were set in, on the frames. I mean, it's down to the nittiest, grittiest of individual details that allow an organization to say definitively what happened and how it happened. And you're right, uh, log files, uh, you know, on the endpoint, log files on the on the target host machine uh, are very easily manipulated in an actual attack. And, you know, a lot of times it's, it's not done when you're doing uh, penetration testing and so forth. Um, and so organizations feel like, well, you know, we caught it because we scraped that log file 12 hours after the attack. And then, you know, our our, our SIM told us about it. Well, an intelligent attacker would have modified that file. You didn't do it in your pen test because you're talking about deleting files or modifying yeah, exactly. uh, artifacts and so mm -hmm. forth. So it's, it's a very different approach and it's one that organizations are, are really starting to uh, take notice of and, and, and starting to engage with us uh, pretty heavily on. Charles, do you have a, a customer success story that you'd like to share with our audience? They tend to really like the kind of putting it in context. Like we helped this customer solve, you don't obviously have to name them, but. Yeah, I mean, probably one of the most interesting, it's, it's a major financial organization that if I did say the name, you know, most people would, would know who I'm talking about. Um, and they suffered a, a security breach. Um, you know, an attacker was able to, to, to get in through some very clever social engineering, and they were able to escalate their privileges. They started off very low, they moved mm -hmm. uh, vertically and, and laterally within the organization, they started hopping from system to system. And uh, pretty soon, you know, they had uh, malware spread within the environment. Um, and they were pretty aggressively attacking this organization. They were smart about it. They were methodical. They'd been in for a couple of months. And when they, when the organization finally became aware of the event, they were, you know, I mean, head and hands, right? Cause they were thinking they were going to be the next major news story. You know, this is a major financial organization. Uh, and they, they were very concerned about the reputational impacts they leveraged. They, they had uh, uh, gigastores deployed throughout their entire infrastructure, right? So everything coming in, in and out, all their ingress, egress points were covered by gigastores. So they were able to go back and they had very long retentions. They had, you know, some of our larger half mm -hmm. petabyte units. So they had long retention windows and they were able to go back and definitively state that while the attacker did get in and they did exfiltrate some call it low level information about, you know, uh, sure. uh, uh, account information that existed for uh, a, a subset of their, their third party user base. None of the none of the payment records, none of the account information was ever exfiltrated from the organization. So they were able to definitively state beyond a shadow of a doubt that while the attacker did make it into their environment, mm -hmm. they didn't suffer an actual data breach because of it outside of the individual attacker. They worked they worked with the, the appropriate authorities. They, they, the, mm -hmm. the attacker was, uh, you know, was arrested and they didn't have to publish this out. So it's one of the greatest stories in the world, right? In security, what are the best stories? The ones you never hear of, right? right and it's right. literally mm -hmm. because they were able to definitively state that the, the, the information that would have made them you know, a, a news story, a headline news story, never left their organization. And one thing I love about that story is they worked with law enforcement and, and got them. And I, I've worked a couple of cases like that. And there's like a few things more rewarding in our work uh, than to know that your forensics work and all of the investigations that you've done as a security practitioner have led to, you know, some being apprehended. So that's right. Yep, absolutely. And I, you know, I wish more people would do it, right? Because, you know, it's, it, it, you know, granted, it's a, it's, it's a drop of water in the ocean, but, uh, you know, there's, there's, right. there's consequences to the, to the actions then, to, mm -hmm. at least to some extent. 
Jeff. Your story highlights a, a very interesting distinction that I, I think a lot of enterprises probably struggle with because, you know, in my experience, which is primarily PCI, the, the organizations that I've worked with or, you know, a lot of the, the famous cases, the, the, the breaches were announced after all the data has been exfiltrated, after, you know, they, they've figured out that, uh, you know, something bad really happened. But, you know, in, in virtually all the cases, the attackers were there for some, you know, d you know weeks, months, if not years, uh, as you said, sort of moving around. Um, can you comment a little bit on, you know, what what your your capabilities are of detecting, you know, the the infiltration, uh, you know, the compromise, uh, uh, you know, the, the attackers are, are here type of thing, even though they may not have, you know, found or figured out, you know, what there is to, that's worth stealing yet something, you know, most of the time, if not all the time, I'm thinking they're looking for data that they can monetize. And, you know, like you, we've said, they're taking their time, they're hunting around, they're looking for the best path out, that type of thing. But, you know, can you distinguish uh, the capabilities of detecting the attacker is here versus uh, sort of the typical disclosure, which is, oh, we just noticed that all the data just got exfiltrated out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to do with, the, you know, some of the traditional concepts around uh, blacklist, whitelist, um, mm -hmm. baseline deviation, right, for the, for, the, for the less sophisticated attacks, and especially on the profiling piece to be able to say, we know what normal behavior is, we, we isolate that down, we create, a, we create an endpoint profile, a subnet profile, a VLAN profile, to be able to say, here is the expectation of what we have for this environment, and then watch for any exception to that rule, right? It's not just major exceptions. It's not major volumetric changes. It's any exception to that policy. A server that suddenly starts communicating on a port that it, it shouldn't be communicating on. Now, that might just be because a new piece of software got loaded on it, but that's something you should be cognizant of and go and research. And it, it's part of the threat hunting approach that organizations are starting to take. And so having a tool set that allows you to watch for that on a day in, day out basis and, and configure that, in addition to watching for the volumetric changes through baselining, in addition to watching for, you know, the traditional blacklist activities, in addition to watching for, you know, certain maliciously formatted uh, packets, like, you know, looking for, you know, constant amounts of, you know, sin fins and those types of things. So being able to, to bring all that together into one portfolio and say, not only do we watch for, you know, the, the big the big movers, but we also watch for the small, seemingly innocuous changes that are happening within the environment. Um, and then, you know, kind of everything in between. And then if anything looks, even you know slightly awry, two clicks and you're down to the individual content, the individual packets. On okay, now I can investigate this. You know, scroll through this quickly. Does it look anomalous? Does it look like somebody installed a patch on the server that maybe opened up some new port or exposed us to something that we might not have been exposed to before, but isn't actually you know malicious activity? Uh, versus, yeah, this 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 definitely looks off, right? I've got to go talk to the server admin. I need to drill into this one a little bit. And so it's it's really about that proactive nature. It, it, it's not about sitting back on on your heels and and you know trusting your trusting your AI, so to speak, right? It's, yeah. it's really about being an active security engineer and, and participating in this process. What, what, I, what I gleaned from that, Charles, putting my attacker hat on, right, is it would be really difficult to 100% emulate normal behavior. In your attack chain, there's always something that you, you're forced to do because you're not the actual user, right? And so even if you're impersonating a user trying to move a, a file around, there's always, like, I feel like there's, uh, a really advanced attacker might figure it out, but what you're doing is really raising that bar of like the attackers got to watch their step because if they're moving files around impersonating users and what, that's going to get flagged somewhere. And so you're really raising that bar for uh, detection of that attacker. Yeah, that's exactly well, it. And, and the attacks are always opportunistic, right? I mean, mm. in almost every situation that we deal with, it's something is opportunistic. Mm. So, Paul, to your point, even if I'm I'm the attacker and I've been able to access your credentials, I inevitably want to go access some system, some file, or participate in some activity that you wouldn't normally participate right. in. And yet you're all I've got to work with. So, you know, I've, I've, I've exactly. got to do that or I've got to start trying to move laterally or vertically mm -hmm. within the organization, mm -hmm. which is also fairly sus suspicious behavior. Right. Even in small, seemingly, you know, I I insignificant amounts. Yep. And that's really what what Viavi's, you know, in the environment to watch for is is not only the big shifts, but also those small, seemingly insignificant amounts. And then being able to forensically investigate what exactly that means. That's awesome. Well, if you want to, to learn this, oh, sorry, Jeff, 
I was just <laughs> final final th- yeah. thought. I just wanted to wrap it up and sort of put it in PCI terms because I suspect a few of our listeners uh, have to deal with PCI. What we're talking about is the difference between the PCI requirements that say you have an incident response program and you know you train your users and your admins to report the anomalies and and the the activities that are weird. That's different from what we're talking about, which I would put into the category, which PCI puts into the category of capturing all the logs, capturing all the event information and monitoring it and reviewing it on an Mm. ongoing basis. You know, PCI requires daily review of, of everything that you're collecting. And that's really what we're talking about. It's the proactive making sure that you're aware of what's normal so that you're more likely to, to you know observe the abnormal and and investigate it and figure out that it's uh, oh, somebody added an app and they didn't follow the procedure, or they did follow the procedure and it just hasn't caught up with everybody that you know the change change management was gone through versus uh, no, this is something really weird. we gotta we gotta escalate this. Absolutely. yeah, that's a great that's a great way to articulate it. Uh, securityweekly.com forward slash Viavi, V-I-A-V, no, V-I-A-V-I, sorry, V-I-A-V-I, Viavi, securityweekly.com forward slash Viavi. Uh, you can find resources there on the topics we're talking about today and more information about Viavi's products. Charles, thank you so much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly. Appreciate you guys having me. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with our topic, I believe, for today, which is talking about identifying and defending against those uh, major Microsoft vulnerabilities. Stay tuned.